Distinguished panel, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Shreya Sinha from ETBFSI, and allow me to welcome you all in this virtual gathering that, set, that seeks to decode the future of fintech. The relevance of this topic has increased on a multitudinous level since the COVID-19 pandemic put operational restrictions on all of us in the month of March. And of course, on an inverse level, when fintechs and their relevance have increased by leaps and bounds. As social distancing norms become commonplace in our society, the value added by fintechs to both businesses on a B2B level and to us on a B2C level can be termed as unprecedented. In the last few months, we at ETBFSI have enjoyed covering and bringing to you a number of fintech related stories, be it of how the usage of digital payment platforms surged or how lending went through a 360 degree transformation thanks to the contactless technology. It should also be noted that fintechs alone were successful in raising money on their ideas despite being in the midst of a pandemic. Now, having seen the best use cases of what fintechs have tried to accomplish in the past few quarters, this brings also to the fore the idea of what lies ahead. And I'm very sure the distinguished panel that awaits us will in the best position simplify, outline and decode what the fintech industry has in store for us. So we have with us today Dr. Ashok Banerjee, a distinguished faculty at IIM Calcutta and who also leads the Financial Research and Training Lab at IIM Calcutta. He's a published author in finance, also the program director for the IIM Calcutta and Talent Sprint. Our second speaker is Dr. Shantanu Paul, who is the founder and CEO at Talent Sprint. He has been a visiting professor of entrepreneurship and computing at leading academic institutions and writes often for business and mainstream media. He also serves on various boards of banks, financial institutions and high tech firms, including the board of the NPCI. And we also have with us Rohit Agarwal, who is the senior director for digital business at Talent Sprint. And in this role, he oversees all the program relationships for the company. Welcome, gentlemen. Now I will request Rohit Agarwal to take the discussion forward. Thank you, Shreya. A uh, very warm welcome to all the participants. And uh, thank you to Shantaru and uh, Professor Banerjee uh, for, for their uh, time here in this uh, event today. So uh, I'll begin with sort of uh, setting up the house. In, in terms of the flow of the event, uh, we will have a discussion with Professor Banerjee and Professor Shantanu here for the first uh, half of the uh, event and then followed by the questions from the uh, participants. So I request you all to feel free to post your questions in the chat that you have and we will take it up towards the later half of the event, right? So uh, let's begin. I would like to start uh, by asking a question to Professor Banerjee here. We all know that, uh, you know, payment habits are slow to change and India is no exception. Uh, nevertheless, if you have seen, uh, the, the Indian economy has had two distinct pushes uh, which has had a profound impact on you know the payment behavior of, of the citizens here the, the first one was the uh, policy induced uh, demonetization and then we have recently seen this natural shock of covid covid 19. so i would like to ask Mr. Banerjee as to what uh, which fintechs do you think have immensely benefited from this two events that have occurred over the last uh, two three years and then it, it could be in terms of penetration or awareness but what is the kind of impact that fintechs have seen uh, due to these two activities. Okay, thank you, and uh, again, good morning to all the viewers. Rohit, before I answer your question specifically, that which industry or which part of fintech is now getting more traction, let me go a little bit back and talk about the big picture. You know, in in any intervention, whether it's technology or otherwise, there are two types of motive. One we call strategy-driven intervention. The other one is crisis driven intervention. Now, in any situation, whatever intervention you take during crisis, it is always painful. But if the intervention is strategy led, it is not painful. It really helps the industry to go further, you know, towards the growth. So what we saw in India is although the traction has improved because of the shocks, the external shocks, as you mentioned about Demon and now the COVID, but what we saw in the fintech industry is that the changes were driven by the need, by the strategy, by the environment, by the market forces. So like you now have industry 4.1, if you ask me, I'll divide fintech into fintech 1.0 and now it is fintech 2.0.
So in 1.0 is after demand. So what happened is a lot of opportunities came up and what we saw at that time after the demonetization is, you know, some flip to the digital payments. So naturally what we saw most visible at that time was payments like e-wallets and digital lending. These two became bigger. There was also another need why these two became bigger and the need was government of India and the policy makers and the practitioners were looking for a solution to reach up to the last mile consumers or the borrowers by minimizing the distribution cost. So financial inclusion, which was a major drive by government of India, was kind of hindered by the lack of access and physically, you know, by the bank correspondence, having more branches, having more ATM, physically you can't access, provide access. There is a limit to that, limit to that growth. And FinTech here, the technology enabled government of India and the players around to have financial inclusion in a way, in a more efficient way by using technology so that you minimize the pain for distribution also at a reduced cost. So that we saw in 1.0. What we are going to see now, COVID has last four months, people actually started working from home and they came up with big ideas. But according to me, in FinTech 2.0, they're going to see a huge intervention of FinTech in the NBFCs, including insurance, in the regulatory environment, reg tax and supervisory tax, and also in analytics in the sense that, you know, fraud detection, and you know churn detection customer lifetime value and all this so analytics regulatory and new areas of financial industry where we did not see too much of it for example nbfc even now even now as we speak is 80 percent manual by manual i mean of course they enter data but they don't use fintech the way banking is using now similarly insurance Insurance, I'll come to that a little later. Insurance is going through a sea change because of the intervention of FinTech. So if you ask me now in 2.0 model of FinTech, these are the sectors which are going to see a lot of change, a lot of disruption. And of course, in terms of scale, the digital lending and the e-wallets will only grow. But these are the new ideas we're going to see. Great. That was very insightful person. So FinTech 1.0 and then FinTech 2.0. Uh, over to Shantanu. So Shantanu, I think uh, in this world of emerging technology, right, uh, uh, we see that NPCI is one uh, company which is like a, a, a non-tangible entity, right, which almost every Indian uses every day. But they are maybe not aware that they are using a product of NPCI. Right? There's so many products that NPCI has come up with uh, in the recent past and very successful one. And uh, you are on the board of NPCI, so uh, what what do you think is the role of NPCI in the Indian fintech ecosystem? No, I think this is before I get going. Let me first uh, applaud uh, ATBFSI for setting up this very exciting conversation. And I think, of course, we just heard from Professor Ashok Banerjee. I mean, his mastery in this field is visible. I mean, the way he structured the discussion. So I would say that uh, you know, uh, to some extent, your point about NPCI being uh, very sort of it's always there, but nobody seems to recognize it. Is like saying you know we are all breathing and consuming oxygen but nobody seems to be thinking about it right it is true that is true having said that i think npci is in some sense the invisible backbone of indian financial payment infrastructure in particular i mean the name says it all national payment corporation of india so if you are drawing money from an atm you are using an npci network behind the scenes because interbank settlement of your you know money moving from your account somewhere else to this atm happening through uh, a system called nfs national financial switch if you're using a rupee card, which is India's Swadeshi card to compete with Visa and Master, and incidentally now it's overtaken Master, it's the number two after Visa. Now that's another great story. I mean, you know, we are trying to build India's, you know, sort of Swadeshi card, and that's now going international, right? Of course, the crown jewel is UPI. Uh, we all know that unified payment interface. All of us since Demon have been, you know, have gotten addicted to Google Pay or Paytm or uh, Phone Pay or any of these, uh, you know, popular apps. So I would say that UPI to me, you know, represents uh, what in this, what India is going to be about. For example, I just give you some statistics for the benefit of the observers here, viewers here who may not know this. But right after demonetization in December of 2016, exactly a month after demonetization, uh, the number of UPI transactions that happened in that entire month in the country was one million, and I'm saying million with an M, 
right? One million in the entire month of December 2016. Uh, this year, earlier this year, in fact, we crossed, in fact, late last year, we crossed uh, one billion transactions a month. That is million with a B, right? So that's a thousand fold increase in less than four years, in fact, three years from inception uh, of this whole journey post demon. So in three years time, the number of transactions per month goes from a million to a billion. And that's a phenomenal uh, thousand fold growth, which is unprecedented. So where is this headed now? If you look at the, the latest shock that we just got from post, uh, you know, I would say the pandemic, uh, now, now cash is considered to be unsafe, dirty. There are people who don't want to deal with cash. I know a lot of people like that. I'm not one of them, but I think there are plenty of people who think cash is potentially a contaminant and then a carrier. So therefore, uh, you know, this more uh, cashless society acceleration is happening. So I think this will now lead to a point where, you know, I think the general assumption predictions have been that, uh, you know, one billion per month, UPI transactions might become one billion per day at some point. The question is when, and the discussion has been that maybe in three years, that was a discussion pre-pandemic. I have a feeling it might happen a lot sooner, right? We might get one billion transactions a day for in two years or 18 months. Which means at that point in time, if you're doing 1 billion transactions per day, which is a billion with a B, that means that every Indian citizen on an average is doing one transaction UPI per day, right? And that kind of seems feasible because we all do cash transactions every day of various kinds. We write other kinds of instruments, right? So in many ways, I think, uh, you know, the, the journey of NPCI is in some sense, uh, you know, we ain't seen nothing yet, right? The movie is... The movie of Ibaki, I have to say, right? So in that sense, uh, the game has begun. And I think as the country goes through this, more technology adoption through smartphones, more of these uh, regulatory situations or even other uh, shocks which are forcing people to convert faster into digital, all of these are favorable tailwinds at some level. So coming out of the pandemic, you know, industries like fintech, maybe health tech, maybe uh, ed tech, all of whom are kind of looking at this as a, like telemedicine, uh, online education, <laughs> financial transactions being totally digital, I think are natural beneficiaries of this, uh, all of that. So I would say that, you know, look at NPCI as, you know, there are probably 25 products in NPCI. Uh, I just mentioned three, I can keep going. But uh, IMPS, another example uh, of a product, which Fast we all use. Fast tag on uh, national tollways, yeah, very good. So there are 20, 25 products, and uh, I think the product portfolio is expanding, and as the expansion happens, this one billion a day happens. So we're no longer talking about enterprise class application. We're talking about citizen play, the scale application, citizen class application. So that's, I think, where this is headed. Yeah. So, so very exciting. I mean, three years, a uh, thousand fold jump, and um, I mean, like you've highlighted all the maybe less than three years, we'll have the next uh, thousand fold jump. From yeah. A billion transactions a month to billion transactions a day. And I'm sure uh, anything that we do, I mean, uh, I I kind of heard one of the earlier interviews uh, from from one of the guys from Google Pay, and the point was. If you build something for India, you're building it for the world, right? So I'm yeah. sure, you know, globally, NPC is being looked up to as a uh, example. Yeah. Uh, moving on, I would like to ask uh, Professor Banerjee about uh, this data that is being captured with with products like this, which are citizen scale. A lot of data is available today, and and many fintechs have launched their products uh, primarily based on the sort of data that they're getting into. And and we we know about uh, companies which have you know hundreds and millions. Uh, of uh, user data and, and for each user they have let's say thousands of data points so with so much of data it's like a it's like it's like a gold mine right and uh where does it lead to like how can this data be used we talked about uh, professor Banerjee highlighted the uh, ndfc's example earlier right that uh, they're not really adapting as fast as maybe the banks do right uh, so can they make use of this data and uh, get get uh, you know going with it i mean how can this data be used if you look at the way fintech is intervening or transforming or disrupting the traditional players, be it NBFCs or banks, by using data, they are doing it in two ways. One, they are giving customers a better experience. So suppose if you look at a traditional NBFC or a traditional bank, they have a form you will fill up and even if they work very efficiently, it takes three days to seven days to approve a loan which today a fintech company, a digital lender is doing in a few hours. So one is experience. So they are telling the traditional players that, you know, this is the way to do business. This is one contribution of the fintech to these traditional companies or traditional industry. The other contribution, which I think is a better, more con uh, imp important contribution is not only they are telling these traditional players how to do it more efficiently, but also they are telling these traditional players how to do it differently. I give an example. 
So insurance, we look at insurance business, the basic business model was that I collect insurance premium, I settle claims, and suppose I settle claim, which is say 50% of the total collection in a year, the remaining 50% remains my surplus. Net of expenses, that's my profit. I don't refund the unclaimed amount back to the guys who have paid the money in the, in, in the first place. But today, FinTech in the insurance space is showing that no, you create a pool of claims, meaning premium, pay the claim and then refund it or carry it forward to next year. It's not like no claim bonus, it is beyond no claim bonus. So they want the insured guys as a stakeholder and participant in running the business and they want to tell the current insurance companies you can't charge 30% margin, your margin should be lower. So that's what I'm saying there. With the data, they are disrupting in two ways. One is better experience. The other one is how to do a different business. They are changing the business model. Now this, the traditional players have adopted. They realized that you know you need to use that. They had all the data. It is not that the, the fintech companies came and said, hey, we have some data you don't have. Banks also had data. NBFs also have a huge customer data, but they never use this data. So I think the greatest contribution of the fintech player is to tell to point a finger to these traditional big daddies that look you have a lot of data you're sitting on a treasure of information but you don't know how to use it and we come here to help you for example in many large banks today when they just take a credit decision they have their own scoring model where they use their own data but one set of data they don't have is the data from the crowd meaning social media and other data so what they do instead of investing money and creating a skill set and a data lake of this social media input they engage with a fintech company which has specialized in say text-based news or a social media uh, news and then they superimpose the fintech model database in mean, a text-based model onto their number model to have a better credit decisions so fintech industry has shown them how to use data so to answer their question whether it is bank nbfc insurance companies all have we look at business the traditional business in a different way and what has helped them there are some you know enabling factors also that help the traditional players one is data today has become cheap so today earlier days you know the cost of obtaining information was exorbitant but today it is very easily available many data are publicly available if you if you don't violate the privacy issues the gdpr and all then data is available at minimum cost for example if i want data of an unlisted company i go to mca website pay 100 rupees to get the entire data so data is cheap secondly storage also has become cheaper gone are the days where i buy big servers and store data upfront investment i can go to cloud so the big players have realized that you know one there's a benefit of using data two data are available and it is easy to store and finally the traditional players have realized whether banks nbfs anybody you take in the financial bfsi segment they are under enormous pressure on the margin the profit margin because of competition so they want to cut costs and they found use of technology is a sure way to cut costs the opex now, so many atms you don't need so many branches you don't need you now have a new banking etc etc these are all ways to reduce cost to, so to generate economic surplus so the data and the fintech is changing the landscape of bfsi in more than one way in many many ways that was very insightful and i think while data is cheap data storage has become cheap i, I guess you know users also these days have are, are ready to pay by data i mean either you pay in cash or pay in data like the same that has been captured really well by fintech so, so talking about fintech how can we not uh, bring up cryptocurrency and uh, uh, you know we've seen historically the monetary monetary authorities have been you know very and skeptical of cryptocurrencies for various reasons like the wide wide, wide fluctuations in the value of these uh, currencies and then this is uh, you know possibility of software bugs uh, darkware etc but then uh, we've seen a recent example uh, that you know the, the central authorities uh, Central banking authorities are ready to adopt those. They can have one example with their CBDC. So, what's your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, this is a great question and perhaps a controversial uh, area to tread into, but I will. Um, I, I think uh, about a month ago, Professor Parth Thore of IIM Calcutta, one of the manager's colleagues, and I co-wrote an op-ed um, uh, that came out uh, essentially, I think it was the Hindu or uh, one of them, yeah, which basically talked about the fact that, uh, you know, China is experimenting with a central bank uh, digital currency. The cryptocurrency world has been, you know, colored by a lot of different. It began with this whole uh, Bitcoin uh, world, and you know, it got a bit, bit of a bad press, made a major comeback again. But now, I think, you know, the central banks of the world are realizing that if you can't beat them, join them, because the idea of a cryptocurrency at a national level, at least, is becoming uh, more favorable. So they will come at a day when we will have uh, sort of a e-dollar, a EUSD, or a EINR. Uh, so China being China, I mean, you know, has uh, run some very strong experiments. I mean, seven cities in China right now have a major, uh, I would say, uh, super pilot uh, program going on where uh, e-Vimon is being used. It's called the e uh, which is being used to basically replace the sort of traditional physical currency. Now, you might ask, why do I need um, a digital currency? Well, think about it, right? I mean, currency has been evolving as a concept for centuries, if not millennium. I mean, there was a time when people used uh, metals, then they used gold, they used silver. Uh, before that, they used shells and they used paper. And then paper has become the de facto for the last maybe 200 years. But as paper goes digital everywhere, else, digitalization of a currency note is also going to happen. So a central bank can issue currencies in digital form to begin with. And then, then cryptocurrency becomes massively important because you need to have traceability of the currency. You know, the total amount of currency M1 money supply, as we call it in economics, that cannot be something that's left to, you know, sort of the market. It has to be controlled centrally. So China, I think, is taking the first step. This has many advantages. I'll give you two, three examples. Um, think about other kinds of things. A lot of uh, cash goes into the, you know, uh, untra untraceable black market sector. You know, you have cyber terrorism, you have people doing crimes, you have other kinds of uh, uses of black money. Uh, with moment you have a, a sort of a digital currency as a nation, uh, the central bank will know exactly who owns and who, which currency is in whose wallet. Wallet meaning in this case your e-wallet, right? So there will come a day, I think, around the world where central bank will give you a, a wallet app, you put on your smartphone, and that whatever money you get will be in your wallet. It will not be like a Paytm wallet, it will be like a central bank wallet issued through your regular bank. And, uh, you know, the, the nation will have a complete, the central bank will have complete knowledge of who has what money in their wallet. Now, it may seem like a good thing from an analytical perspective because Professor Banerjee talked about the benefit of analytics. We'll get phenomenal insights into the country's spends and what people are spending money on, where they're hoarding, where they're spending, what gets. So for planners and economists, this is a dream come true that we know exactly where the currency is with whom. Today, when we carry paper currency, the central bank doesn't know which currency note is with you and which is with me. But in digital, it will be obvious that they know. But having said that, there are downsides to it. We have to be a little careful with this because the downside is that, you know, the big brother society is anyway encroaching upon us, right? Everywhere in the world, governments are becoming more powerful. You look at, look at China's face detection algorithms, you know, you basically people are being publicly shamed in public squares for not filling a parking fine or whatever, right? So I think while it is, there are at least half a dozen great reasons to have digital currency, which I think anyway inevitably will come. Now that China has rolled the ball, people will have to catch up. But I also worry about privacy rights, I worry about uh, social dimensions of extreme traceability or extreme big brotherhood that may come with all of this. So I think like all great innovation is the double-edged sword. Right, right. Very insightful. And I think uh, I remember one of your earlier interviews uh, where it was also found that a lot of money is lost in this transaction also, right? The so-called plumbing that we have, it yeah. gets done there. So yeah. one one upside to this would be that uh, that six, seven percentage which is getting stuck somewhere yes. also gets money. Yeah. But talking about plumbing, you're not referring to the movie the plumbing, right? What is that called? Choked, right? Choked, yes. It's yes. Actually, yes. money literally gets stuck in the plumbing. That's really interesting. So, Professor Banerjee, the uh, next question to you. Uh, while, while we've seen that, you know, uh, post this COVID-19 pandemic, across uh, sectors, we, we have seen, you know, uh, pink slips. But then FinTech has come out of this little lining, right? And there's a recent report uh, by PwC, which, which indicates that uh, by the end of 2020, uh, there'll be a 42% rise in the need for fintech talent, fintech professionals. So what's your uh, thoughts on this? What's the opportunities for professionals who are aspiring to get into fintech? Yeah, so thank you for this question. The other day I was talking to one search agency, you know, the executive search agency, 
they said that even during this COVID last three months, the maximum uh, number of applications and the fulfillment placement happened in the area of data science overall. So they're saying that that's a sector, that's an area, it's not a sector, it's an area where COVID has shown them, the industry, that you know, you cannot live without them. So therefore, there's a huge demand for data science uh, courses and people, the data scientists in general. But within that, fintech has a huge scope. Why? Because fintech is still in its very early days. Although India is big in fintech, perhaps next to China, but still it is early. There are a lot of sectors where the penetration is low, as we discussed earlier, the BFSI, many sectors penetration is low. And people are hungry for students or candidates, professionals who understands what is fintech. That means who understands this, the domain as well as the technology. So, and in India, there are very, very few uh, courses available which offer this marriage of technology plus finance and industry needs them. As I said earlier, that traditional sectors, traditional companies are adopting fintech because they realize they can, cannot live without them. There is a good debate now going on between high touch versus no touch in lending. So the no touch is like digital lending, there's no touch at all. The high touch is still the microfinance institutions who still believe in high touch. That means relationship, physical relationship with the customer. In these four months, their business has gone down drastically because their foot soldiers cannot go and meet the customer. And they, who till now staunchly opposed this digital lending and they said it doesn't work in rural areas, in tier four, five, six cities in, the, in India, they have realized in the last three months that you need to have a hybrid model of high touch versus no touch. And they are today embracing. So even in newer areas like microcredit, there will be demand for fintech professionals. So not only in big companies, even in smaller ones, because they have realized that you can't ignore completely by saying, I don't need, you know, fintech. So there's a huge scope, at least I foresee in next five years, at least, there will be the demand for fintech would be growing in double, you said 40%. I don't know whether it will be 40% for next five years, but clearly more than any other sector, because the manufacturing sector, we're getting more automated, their job requirement, head counts will be lower. So it is it will be in the service and within services, the fintech is going to hog the long light, line light. Right, right. And, and like it's been said, uh, uh, due to this, uh, uh, you know, the whole pandemic, which led to so much of lockdown across the globe, right? A lot of behavioral changes are going to be irreversible. So maybe this whole idea of micro lenders embracing digital lending will probably continue forever now. They will never have to uh, come back to having their physical relationship, right? I mean, at least not go back to what it was earlier. Moving on, uh, I think uh, you all know that we have a, a program on fintech and financial blockchain, which is by Ann Calcutta in association with Talent Fund. So, Mr. Banerjee, you have been a program director for this, uh, this program and uh, uh, it has seen over 250 professionals go through this already and it's into getting into its third cohort now. So how is the design of this program going to help uh, aspiring professionals uh, in, in, the, in this industry? So you see, whenever a business school like I am Calcutta offers a program for the executives, we focus more on application of it. So had it been offered an engineering college, we would have given that, they would have given much more emphasis on the technology part of FinTech. We do. It's not that we ignore, but we put it in a way that is acceptable and understandable to the professionals. So in our program, the unique part is, of course, we discuss blockchain, we discuss uh, cryptos, but our central focus in each module is how is it applicable? Why is it important for people? To know? So I think over these two cohorts, we have done it for more than one year now. We have initially we designed it based on feedback from some people through survey, but now we got real feedback from the professionals who had gone through this program, the alumni, if you like, and also from the industry. And this feedback helped us to fine tune the curriculum for this program and make it more industry focused. So today we can say, after this experiment for more than a year, this program is more industry ready and you don't want, does not need to be 
a super techie guy to understand this course. Similarly, one does not need to be an expert in finance to understand this course. It's an intersection between technology, finance, and a little bit of computing and maths. So therefore, it's a sweet spot, I believe, we have found through this program. And go, if we go by the number of interests that we see in every year, because we only can take limited number of students in a batch, we can't take too many. But if you see the number of interests per batch, it is growing. So it kind of gives us a signal that maybe industry has found it useful. And the future uh, you know, participants also would equally love to uh, and, you know, go through this program. Great, great. Any, any thoughts from you, Shantru, on this uh, format of the program? Because, uh, you know, post this pandemic, like I said, a lot of things are changing. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially the program was a blended format with visits to campus. Sure. But now I'm sure uh, there's been some change. So, would sure. you like to talk about that? Yeah, no, I, 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 as Professor Banji was speaking, I'm reminded of the time in 2018 when we were batting about how to launch this program. We spent about six months between IM Calcutta and Talentsman Leadership spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to bake this cake, the recipe, basically. What is the first recipe going to look like? And that's where we talked about industry surveys and all that, right? So I think one of the things that I always believe now very deeply, and as a working professional who might be watching this show, I would strongly say that the future is in the hands of people who are going to have what I call the pracademic skill set. Now, what is a pracademic skill set? It's that, you know, if you are an extreme practitioner who cannot associate yourself to the frameworks that are evolving in your field, you're going to have yeah, a lot of action, a lot of activity, but you may not actually see the kind of rapid career growth without a certain theoretical and conceptual framework to tie your experiences together and your learning together. So being a practitioner with an academic bent of mind is the sign of a pracademic. That's one example. The other example is if you're solid in academics and you're completely like, you know, sort of in this position where you can be a professor, but you are also going to have to apply this in the field, as Professor Henry said, that you know the value of this learning is only as good as application. So while you learn the frameworks, and then you have to apply it. In Bloom's taxonomy of learning, we call it not just to know, but to be able to apply. Not just to, be able to apply, but to be able to design, right? So it's, it's that hierarchy of needs of learning that we are trying to aspire for here. And I think one of the great successes of the program, which is why I think it has been rated as one of the most successful launches of any exeget program, both for IAM Calcutta and for Talent Sprint, because of the enormous first year uh, traction, and, and, and I would say, support that we inbound support that we got. And uh, I think the academic formula is really working here well, right? I mean, you get your practical hands-on, you get your academic moorings, but you're not getting only one or the other. You're getting both, and you're getting it both blended. I think that's been one major content-wise innovation, I would say, to basically second what Professor Banerjee already said. The other thing about the format question that you asked is, yes, of course, we believe in this hybrid model where we believe in, uh, you know, uh, I would say that uh, high-tech, high-touch combination, right? You want uh, a high-tech delivery system, a platform through which you can do live interactive classes every week, which by all indications has been a great success. The, the word of mouth, net promoter score, customer feedback is extremely high for this program, right? We all know that. On the other hand, um, you know, you just don't want a pure uh, online experience. You want to make some visits. So we added this structure where there was like two campus visits for a couple of days each in the beginning and end of the six-month program. And that, I think, remains the gold standard of combining high-touch and high-tech-based delivery. How, having said that, this is an exceptional year. So, you know, uh, the pandemic changes everything. Safety becomes more paramount than anything else. So wisely, I think I'm Calcutta has taken a decision, which we have supported, that for this upcoming cohort, uh, we may have to just be a little more careful about how we do all this, and we may have to make it more online, and even the physical contact pieces may have to just be adjusted towards the very end, perhaps one visit at the very end. So, um, so my view is that, look, both in terms of the practical academic hybrid mix and the on-site online or high-touch, high-tech mix, I think the program has achieved an optimum balance which suits the need of uh, the working professional of today who's aspiring to build a career in finance. So if you're a finance professional, I think FinTech is inevitably going to be in your path and you have to be ready to grapple with it, maybe make a sort of contribution to it. And if you're a tech professional, well, guess what? The, the, the beautiful thing about Indian tech industry is that 40% of the revenue of Indian tech comes from finance sector companies. So in my view, it's like a building with two major doors, right? You come in through one door and go out the other, but both doors are open, right? You come in through the finance door, go out of tech, come in through tech, go out of finance. And we have seen people from these programs who have taken uh, these courses to come out and actually form startups, right? So I think this is also becoming a bit of an incubation ground for future startups. That's my belief and hope. Right, great, great. I think we'll move on to questions from the audience. There's a lot of uh, 
questions here on the chat. So I'll read these questions out. Uh, please uh, feel free to post uh, questions that you may have uh, through this chat here. Uh, so uh, let me just pick up uh, something to begin with. So this is this question from Lakshmi Kant Gupta. This is how fintech will have to take care of GDPR and data privacy norms, whether increase in compliance cost will make them uneconomic. So how is this whole uh, you know cost around making it comply? You know, with, with increase in the compliance cost, how will it will it make it uneconomic? Is the question basically? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. Unfortunately, India, you know, compliance costs run high, right? The cost of doing business. I mean, there's a reason why India is ranked number 177 in the world or whatever it is that we're very proud of. That we say that we have gone from being 198th in the world to 170th in the world or whatever. I, th I think the cost of doing business in India is very high because there's a lot of regulatory and compliance friction, right? Now, I would argue, I would make a contra argument to the questioner's point that the only way you're going to actually be able to scale your business large enough in India where your R2s are generally lower than the rest of the world is if you use technology, right? Use technology, you get massive scale. Our population is our customer base. That's a huge advantage. Use technology to scale up and then your compliance cost becomes affordable. If you run a brick and mortar business today in finance or financial services, I think you cannot scale fast enough without technology, without fintech to actually service that compliance cost, right? So in many ways, I would say that the answer to compliance problems in India, which aren't going up anytime soon, is lies in actually technology as a scale factor. That's point number one. The second point I think is about GDPR and data privacy. You know, I think, uh, uh, you know, India is kind of struggling. We're kind of going in two directions at the same time. You know, if you look at what has happened with data privacy, I think there's been a lot of legitimate concern of uh, other data and other data being exposed. And now Supreme Court is very much on it. And then we're gonna have a bill privacy bill that's been on the anvil around the GDPR standards, right? So that's going to come. But at the same time, if you look at our Arupi Setu application, right? It's an open field for uh, lack of privacy, right? So this information, I think the governments of the world are struggling with saying we want to give citizens privacy, but we also want to collect so much data that we know a lot about people. I don't think this is a, at a company level issue. This is a macro challenge that we'll have to navigate. My personal view is that, uh, to fight compliance related costs, we have to scale faster with technology. Any any thoughts from Professor Banerjee? Yeah, so if I can add here, so if you look at banks, for example, and to some extent insurance companies, not so much in for the alternative investments, the compliance is huge. And today, even the smartest of banks has army of people in the department who only look after compliance. So it is not only the time cost of, you know, spending time on compliance, there is a hard cost also. So many people's salary goes. And hence, an opportunity has come up and there are few FinTech companies today who have developed tools to take over the regulatory compliance of all these banks. So instead of having 10 people working in the department to just outsource the entire task to a FinTech company, and they do the compliance. For, not only they do the compliance for you, they give you signals. So they say, suppose your tax has to be paid or RBI weekly report has to be filed. So they do it. And thirdly, I have seen some of these tools. It is pre-filled to some extent in such a way that in the department, in the company or in the bank, you need to have only one guy to fill up the deltas because it doesn't, most of the information doesn't change on a day-to-day -day or on a week-to-week -week basis. So one is the fintech advent of fintech has drastically reduced or going to reduce the regulatory compliance cost. However, it might lead to an extra cost in terms of societal compliance. So as um, uh, Shantanu was saying that the privacy issue, how much you go. So some NBFCs are craving that earlier we used to have access to other now we are not allowed. So, you know, KYC is taking more time. And if there are some databases where API is not allowed by the regulator, is that deliberately done so that you know you don't breach that privacy? So yes, one cost is going to go down, which is regulatory cost, but the other cost might increase. All right, yeah, lots of questions here. Uh, I'll pick up the next one and uh, probably direct this to Professor Banerjee again. So the question is from Naveen Sharma, and it goes uh, as follows: So how can finance professionals who have spent the last decade on working for other industries get into fintech? Uh, so is there any short academic course or applied training available which can bring those who want to join this uh, sector, you know, bring them up to speed? So uh, to, to kind of 
package yeah. it on the way what's the role of uh, uh, the the program that you already talked about right the advanced programming fintech and financial blockchain so is that something that can help such professionals who have been into the finance world over the last decade but now want to get into the fintech industry yeah my direct first answer would be that you have you are in the right way we not today so the answer that you are seeking is there today that's what we are discussing so if you have a domain expert if you have finance knowledge and banking knowledge that's great because then this course is going to really transform you see you don't need to be after this course join a fintech company as i said earlier in my discussion that even if you are with a bank you need to work with the fintech guys you can't avoid going forward so unless you know understand how the fintech world works you cannot negotiate with them you cannot discuss with them you cannot work with them so therefore this course is going to help you maybe to start something on your own you see opportunities or also to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of your own organization because fintech has to be embraced by everybody let me add to that point uh, i was just uh, as, as professor banjo was speaking as a reminder of an example uh, many of you know that uh, while talentsprint is an edtech company uh, uh, when participants join our programs uh, they are able to also uh, take advantage of financing where they can you know take uh, financing from uh, fintechs which are digital lending fintechs which can give that kind of you know the three minute or three hour sub three hour sub three minute kind of a decision to approve your loan right uh, based on very sort of specific data so in other words digital lending has become a part of talent sprints own sort of adjacent offering to participants who are joining these programs like even the fintech program now if you look at the finance people in talent sprint the, the chart accountant who's our head of finance and i think she has become an expert on digital lending by virtue of having to kind of deal with all these fintech companies which are hovering around all of us all the time saying that we want to lend more to talent sprint you know participants so in other words uh, if you are a finance professional who's traditionally been a ca doing a more structured finance function or a company secretary or a you know anybody who says okay i'm working in manufacturing as a finance person for the last 10 years the fact is digital payments digital lending all of these thing micro insurance digital insurance all of these are going to surround you matter of time right so it is actually going to make you a far better professional to have a really good landscape view of the space and become to some extent a reasonable observer reasonable commentator on the space so i think traditional finance people in my view are actually very solidly green signal uh, segment for this kind of a program right and i think uh, in in some sense you have actually answered the next question this this comes from dr uh, kurshi rakhtar so you know what are the challenges and opportunities for fintech in higher education sector you just talk about an example of how uh, fintech is helping finance growth for uh, an edtech company like like us no, i would like to add here just sure, sure. add one this question so when people who talked about higher education so i'm from academics i can tell you if you look at top finance journals today the top journals the top 5 you will find in the last two years the number of papers on fintech is on the rise now what does it mean that means the research at the academics are taking interest in what is going on in fintech see they are they are getting attracted by data so for example recently there was a paper which is published in a big journal called rfs review of financial studies which looked at digital credit score so what they did was they compare the traditional model of say sibil in india or in the us fico score with the digital credit score which is based on digital footprint so all the digital lending company that shantanu was talking about 3 minute or 3 hours they use digital footprints which smartphone you are using is it android or iphone etc and create a score and they claim that their delinquency is lower than a traditional lender's delinquency so therefore academician i want to know is it your word versus my my word or is some truth so they are looking at large data and coming out with papers research and that is getting published so that publication by the academics actually provide support credibility that there is a third party who has no interest being a technology company or a bank the third party is doing some kind of validation on the claims of the fintech companies that yes we are deserved that's another and i would say the benefit of this entire discourse and curriculum and courses on fintech if i may add to the round of questions are waiting but i'm tempted to uh, put a rejoinder to this um, you know um, 
if you uh, look at the talent sprint deep talk series uh, going back i think seven eight months ago um, uh, i interviewed satish pillai who is the ceo and md of sibyl right and and uh, in that if you can go it's, it's a, it was a very interesting title the title uh, was uh, torturing data to extract confessions right? that was the title of that talk and uh, that's exactly what you know large amounts of data need to be kind of squeezed and massaged and tortured at some times to get coax the data out right the insights out so in that sense uh, he made a very interesting point and i'm reminded of that point because i found it a very shockingly interesting insight which i don't know if it is really true or not and professor banerji may actually want to pursue this uh, hypothesis so what he said was that one of the things that help uh, that apparently is a is a uh, is a conjecture out there that people who leave their phones uh, or very, have very low charge all the time. So if you're a person whose phone is always in very low charge versus Rohit, that's I'm the person whose my phone is always like at 25% charge, let's say, right? Because I'm too lazy to charge it fully. Versus someone like Rohit whose phone is always 85% charge because he's very diligent. Turns out that delinquency wise, I'm going to be a bigger defaulter than him. That a person whose phone charge is always low is less likely to pay back on time than a person who uh, charges phones on time. Now, it's a very behavioral issue. I'm sure it could be an anecdotal story. But the point I'm making is the CEO of Sybil is sitting there thinking about these issues. That's the point. Right or wrong, proven or not yet. But he's saying that these kinds of insights are beginning to matter. Right? So I thought that, you know, it's, it's a whole new, new world out there and how you look at, uh, you know, what makes somebody credible. And I think if I may just add to that, another point that we can see in that discussion was, you know, the number of contacts that you have in your phone, right? I mean, if I'm someone who has got thousands of contacts, I mean, I'm more credible and a lot of people known to me. Versus, so you, oh yeah. yeah. Which has been the history of self-help, social self-help groups, which has right. been the basis of microfinance, right? Okay. Anyway, we'll move on. Okay. So uh, the next one here from uh, Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep says, I have a ticket of experience into business development and sales with multiple industries. And right now with the, uh, you know, mid management uh, in one of the FinTech firms. So what role can I have with my employer after completing this course, the FinTech and financial blockchain course? So, Professor Banji, what's your take on this? Yeah. So see today, FinTech, if you look at the delivery channel, there are two models, broadly speaking. One is B2B model, institution to institution. Other one is B2C. Sometimes it is B2B and then C. So in B2B model, B2C I can do through social media campaign, etc. etc. But in B2B model, you need professionals who understand the domain and also the product, who can go and make presentation and penetrate. Because you know, in the traditional company, business, suppose I'm not just naming, but don't take the otherwise. I want to I am a fintech company who has a solution for banks. I would like to have the largest public sector bank as my customer. So I want to go and penetrate and sell my product. The problem is this largest public sector bank wants to deny that somebody else can do a better job. So getting the first access to them and you know, get, get them listen to you requires a lot of effort. Just connection will not work. So there you need a guy who completely understands the subject and talks with confidence. Now, because this gentleman has done sales business development. If he or she wants to now shift to fintech, that prior experience will help with the new knowledge of fintech to get into these big players and get into the large offices and make them here. So I think there will be synergy between his prior experience and this course. I just want to add to this because this is a also a very favorite topic of mine. You know, uh, people always ask that what makes a great business developer, right? And in the knowledge sector like finance and tech and consulting, I have come to the conclusion after talking to a lot of experts who are great business developers over the years, that the most important goal for a business development or a salesperson is to be seen by the potential customer as a trustworthy advisor. Right? You don't want to be seen as a vendor. You want to see the trusted advisor. Now, it turns out if you sort of try to dismantle the meaning of what builds trusted advisory relationships, you know, who are the people that are easily trusted? Turns out that in high tech industries or high knowledge industries like finance and tech, there are two factors that make you a trusted advisor easily. One is your likability, interpersonal skills, and one is your mastery of the subject. So if you are a person who is highly likable and you therefore already have an advantage, the layer of mastery and knowledge of the domain is going to give you the second piece of the leg, which is to say that when when uh, important buyers meet professionals who are both likable as well as show that expertise and knowledge of the subject, 
your chances of closing a deal are many fold higher than lack of one or both. Uh, the next one from Ekta Kumar, and I would uh, request Professor Banerjee to take this up. The question is, how is social media being used in credit decisioning? Right? I mean, I have had the privilege of attending a few of your lectures, Professor Banerjee. We have talked about uh, social media analysis and you know uh, social news analysis in, in some of your lectures. So I think this is a, a pertinent one. How is social media being used in credit decisioning? Okay, so if you join this program, you know you will uh, have a three-hour session on this, but to put it very briefly, the regulators, lenders all use social media. They claim that they use social media input, the text, the opinion, and the impression, and the networking, as Rohit was saying, you know, how many people follow me, etc., to take a credit decision. But let, so they claim, but let me tell you, it's an extremely difficult task using or processing social media to take a credit decision is a real challenge. And the last word has not yet been said. Fintech companies are still grappling because if you're a tech guy, you'll understand that if you want to use social media information and put in my product into my engine of credit uh, score and credit decisions, a lot of rules you have to put. I just give you an example. People in the social media use, you know, emojis, the emoticons as we know. Oh, how the uh, and emoticons keep changing. Maybe every week new new emoticons come. Now, if I am a developer, I need to understand the emotion behind each emoticons, which means I have to make rules. I know a company I will not name, which has thirty thousand rules for getting this emotion out of social media text. So the point I'm trying to make is, although the companies are claiming that they are using social media, they are using, but to what extent? They may be using 10% of the content of social media, which is supposed standard language. But there is 90% of content social media equally rich, which is very hard to crack computationally. It's a very hard problem to solve. And that's where lies the opportunities. So you will see more and more people are coming out. There are research going on in top universe in the US on how to handle those 80, 90% of the stuff in social media. Yes, it has a lot of opportunities. But what we are seeing now is just, you know, of the iceberg in terms of utilization right right i think a couple of more questions before we wind up so this next one is from anupam and anupam says that the chartered accountant have been working in the financial services domain without any uh, programming background so you know how much value can i add to my firm working primarily in the space of fintech fintech apps development after doing this course after doing the fintech program that we are referring to so let me put it very bluntly that, that you know you will not become a developer after doing this course but because you are a chartered accountant you understand the domain when you talk to a developer and tell the business need you can have a more meaningful discussion that means you should be able to convey what you need to the developer in a language that the developer understands today you convey it in a language that you understand developer doesn't but tomorrow after this program, you can actually talk to them and appreciate the tools that the fintech companies you know, create that way. So please don't expect this course will make you a developer, but it will give you enough input to appreciate what a developer does and also to appreciate the product and so that you have better conversation. I think uh, to you, Shantanu, know, there's one question from uh, Goswami about how is AI revolutionizing fintech? Your take on this. Well, I think the amount of time left on this call isn't enough to even do justice to that question, but I appreciate the question nevertheless. I'll give you one example, and this might be enough to make the point. So we talked about UPI at the very beginning, right? And we talked about how the number of transactions have been galloping up and et cetera. So just take today's situation. I'm just going to quickly do some mental math here for all of us. I know be entirely accurate. So today there are a billion transactions happening a month, let us say on UPI, right? And those of you who actually understand UPI a little better will know that there are two kinds of UPI calls, a send call and a collect call, right? So I send money to you, which is obvious, trivial, people understand it. Collect is a more tricky area where I'm sending you a request to collect. So you buy something from the Kirana shop, the Kirana shop sends you a collect request for the money and you pay it off, right? That's kind of the idea of a collect. It's a very powerful idea. But as you can imagine, a country like India, collect is being abused extensively for fraud, right? You know, you, you call elderly grandparent and say, you know, I'm sending you money. Please say yes to the link that I'm sending you. But instead of sending a send link, you're sending a collect link, 
the money is going out of the person's account, of your elderly grandparents' account, not going in. So in other words, even though collect is a very powerful functionality, it has a high propensity for fraud. So today, if you look at the actual transactions, it turns out that a billion um, sort of transactions are happening a month. So if I divide by 30, let's say there are 30 million transactions happening a day, right? Now, 30 million transactions happening a day divided by 10% of that is collect, right? So that's what, 3 million transactions a day, okay, right? So 3 million collect transactions are happening a day, right? In which it turns out approximately 100 to 200 are fraud cases. This is the daily reporting rate of uh, UPI today. I'm just giving you ballpark numbers and not be entirely accurate. Now, you want to figure out in 3 million collect transactions are going by in real time, how to trap and catch these 100. Right. Now, all of you making Google Pay payments, etc., know that you know, occasionally your payment doesn't happen. It fails, right? It gets taken to a manual queue for inspection because there is some perception that you know you may have made a transaction. So all of us who are genuine uh, people doing genuine transactions, we get very frustrated when the Google Pay or you know Paytm uh, UPI payment doesn't settle, and we pay, and then suddenly it's hanging there saying you know in processing, in processing, and you, you get to hear in two hours that it's failed or closed. We all get confused by that, right? We don't like it. So genuine payers should not be stopped. And yet fraudulent payments, collect payments have to be stopped. And you have 3 million transactions flying by in real time. Now you tell me without AI, how on earth are you going to figure out which 100 or 200 to stop? There's no human way of inspecting it. I can go deeper into this. I mean, I can give you much deeper statistics into what is actually happening. But this is a problem that NPCI is trying to solve very badly. Because even if you have an algorithm that can actually flag fraud, the so-called false positives are so high that it affects genuine customers and it destroys customer experience. So how do you make sure customer experience is high? You let the good guys go through without stopping them, and only the few bad guys, you stop them immediately and don't let the fraud happen, correct? And while well, 3 million transactions are floating by on a daily basis. Right. I challenge you to give me a solution without AI, which can solve this problem. You cannot. Your ultimate solution will lie in having a system that is smart enough to classify with high accuracy and very low false positives and very low false negatives. I hope that was useful uh, as an example. And I, I must add that, you know, I have been a beneficiary of AI being used here because uh, I, I recall one example where I was doing some payment uh, using UPI uh, almost a year ago. And instead of doing X in one shot, for some reason, I tried doing 0.1X 10 times to the same person. And I was shocked and rather surprised to get a call from a banker at 2 a.m. This was happening post midnight, right? At 2 a.m., where my transaction is stopped and the banker wanted to clarify if it is really me who's doing it or some but he kind of trying to do a call there. So I definitely AI has a big role to play here. And uh, talking about fraud, there was one more question, I think the last one before I uh, close this session here. So uh, we've talked about how NPCI has scaled, uh, you know, to what it is today, right? From, you know, 1 billion a month to 1 billion a month and, you know, looking up at 1 billion a day. Uh, but then senior citizens who have this perception of uh, security being a major uh, threat, right, when they do digital. And you just give an example of failing versus collecting. So is this something that can be really done about uh, managing this whole perception that elderly uh, people have that, you know, this could be probably a fraud. Uh, fraud so, so what is the concern? The concern is that elderly people are vulnerable or they are reluctant to participate? They are reluctant to uh, participate. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think this, that goes hand in hand because they're vulnerable, they're reluctant to participate. That happens, I think, with any generational technology change. I remember a time when my grandfather or my uncles would refuse to put a ATM card in an ATM machine because their fear was that the ATM machine will chew up the card and never give it back, right? But none of us had that fear. None of us had that problem. It's a generational shift. So to some extent, people who grow up a large part of their lives using one mode of technology, for them, a disruptive new change is quite disconcerting and it kind of throws them off. So some of it gets solved by people, better education, better training, better support, assisted family members. You know, sometimes your kid will help you figure it out, et cetera, et cetera. And some of it is just wait for time to take care of it. You, know? you don't have to kind of solve every problem all the time. I think there's a lot of other questions here, but uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, overshot by three minutes already. So I would like to close it here. Uh, I thank all the participants for joining us uh, today. Uh, we will take these questions up and get back to you offline. Uh, uh, with, with the responses uh, wherever we can. And uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee, for taking out time to be a part of the session. Thank you, Chandra, for being part of this. And uh, thank you, Robert. It was very insightful. I must say, I'm sure all the participants have enjoyed this. And thanks to the Economic Times team for uh, organizing this uh, uh, event. So thank you all once again. And uh, just closing, 
uh, remarks from me, the third cohort of the FinTech and Financial Blockchain Program, the Advanced Program in FinTech and Financial Blockchain by Am Calcutta in association with Talismant is uh, starting on the 6th of September. So for all those who are keen to build this FinTech expertise, I would uh, encourage you all to explore this and see if it really suits your uh, you know, needs and aspirations that you have, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.